very good afternoon or very good morning in, Amer in Latin America when the world started to recover from the effects of the COVID-19. It's hard to face the serious consequences caused by the war aggression against Ukraine. And in Latin America, we did not escape this global uh, context, which is a real challenge. And this generates more complexity in the world economy, which were already impacted by the vulnerability of uh, the value chain and the high prices of transport. The uh, plans for growth in Latin America for 2022 were adjusted to the lower between 1.8 and 2.4 percent, even though we acknowledge the features and the risks, especially faced by each economy. All are faced to external challenges that make inflation more risky and increases financial costs. Even though the international price of uh, raw materials, it, it favors some economies, the price of energy and food is already reflected in our economies throughout the region. Therefore, it requires immediate measures to mitigate the social economical effects that can be foreseen so that we avoid a new threat over the whole food security that would affect the most vulnerable groups and communities and that could raise more social, new social tensions. But it also offers opportunities, a vast um, deposit of natural resources, the environmental agenda, the increase of tourism, creativity with new models of business, which are so important. A financial flux and investments in our region are a few of the topics that we will discuss this afternoon. And we have the honor to have the President Ivan Duque from Colombia, the uh, President Luis Abinader from the Republican Dominic, the Vice President, uh, first Minister of Inclusion and Social Development of Peru, Dina Boluarte, and uh, the President of Costa Rica, Don Rodrigo Chavez. Welcome to you all. I would like to ask you, President Duque, before anything, uh, first of all, I would like to thank you for being with us again in Davos. This is the fourth year of your mandate, and you have probably accumulated a great deal of experience with a lot of success and an ambitious agenda that we have been on honored to collaborate with. But you must have served also a great challenge due to the COVID crisis with the consequences in terms of health and social and economic repercussions, as well as political repercussions as well. So which are the main lessons learned by Colombia and also Latin America with regards to uh, building resilience and repairing for new risks or preparing for new risks. Well, first of all, thank you very much, Marisol. It's a pleasure to be again here in Davos. And thank you for not just moderating this panel, but for uh, being always there with our region. Also, hello to uh, Pre President Abinader, Vice President Abina, Baluarte, Abina and uh, Dina and uh, President Chavez. It's a pleasure to to be with all you. First of all, when I was a uh, candidate uh, to the president, uh, presidential election, I was asked, what is your favorite, favorite uh, word? I said resilience. And the, uh, uh, the journalist uh, asked me, resil what? It seemed like it was an unconventional word. But today, we all use this word. For me, the definition of resilience means to uh, turn adversity into an opportunity. And it was very very hard for us uh, because uh, the economy was raising above the uh, world uh, average and the, the um, Latin America average. We had, uh, uh, for the, the first time in eight years, this great success. And then came COVID. That was in 19, 2019, sorry. So, and we had two opportunities, either to Long, linger in the crisis or turn it uh, into an opportunity. Of course, the effects of the pandemic were very hard. But if I'm asked to show some indicators that show Colombia's resilience, I would point out several. The first one, we 
we uh, raised 10.6 percent. We grew. We grew 10.6 percent, and this year we grew 8.5 uh, points, uh, which is the best uh, quarter uh, ever seen by Colombia in the last last 10 years. And also multidimensional poverty. Me and once you've measured all the different factors in Colombia in 2021 was the least one when we since we measure multidimensional poverty then other factor third factor uh, uh, was the labor vulnerability uh, the last measure by the Statistics Institute of Colombia showed the uh, that uh, in labor informality has gone down in Colombia a lot. So we've sh also other things uh, appeared. The m most important uh, time where uh, 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 housings were s bought, uh, we reached to transform the energetic matrix in the middle of pandemics, going from 28 megawatt of uh, new renewable to 2,800 this year and the greatest investment in infrastructures that uh, so that in August we will have inaugurated the same number of kilometers than in the last 25 years in Colombia. So this is resilience. Now come the challenges. And as we were discussing with President Abinader, whom I appreciate very much, about the risks that we see. Well, for the world, we've, we've heard about uh, food security. In our country, there's still a lot of uh, agricultural uh, frontier. We have uh, 20 million uh, potential, and we only uh, operate in 9 million. And also, we have uh, energy. We have oil, gas, carbon, and we also have non-conventional renewable that will help us go into green hydrogen and other fuels. And then thirdly, now we hear about uh, near shoring, French shoring. We hear about new uh, our countries could be new industry settings, uh, thinking about uh, North American countries. So I cover the definition of resilience, the result, and the future potential of resilience. And uh, let me ask you. Uh, uh, one thing, you uh, mentioned informality, and this affects us all in Latin America. Could you mention just one strategy, the most successful one, to uh, transform informality in formality? What would it be? Well, first of all, we need more pro-company uh, government. I, uh, candid I was a candidate and said that I would lower uh, taxes for companies. Uh, I wasn't very popular, but then we got good results. We could uh, deduct 50% of local uh, taxes, and we eliminated uh, tax that enable to create more investment, and it also helps creating employment. And in the middle of the pandemic, when the unemployment was growing, we decided to subsidize 25 uh, percent of the minimum wage to any employment for youth between 18 and 28 years old. And 400,000 employments were created, and, and this has helped us reducing uh, labor informality. Thank you, President. Uh, these uh, figures uh, re uh, reveal a lot. I was, uh, I had the opportunity to be with President Abinader uh, not long ago in Santo Domingo. And uh, President Abinader, I would like to know how you ch faced the effects of pandemics and the disruption of uh, uh, value chains um, and now the war and the inflation. Thank you, Marisol. We've just been at a w, w, WHO um, meeting, uh, uh, like uh, uh, and like here, one of the greatest events that has taken place uh, since the last two years. And the uh, Secretary General has uh, showed us about the way uh, the pandemics worked. Um, we are a touristic country, unlike um, the rest of Latin American countries, and uh, with the exception of the small Car Caribbean uh, states. And uh, we have here our friend Rodrigo Chavez, who uh, where uh, that 
whose country uh, has uh, also great tourism, but uh, 16%, between 16 and 18% of our GDP uh, comes from tourism, and 20% of employment also depends on tourism. So guess what the sector, mo what the most affected sector was were to, by pandemic? It was tourism. That's why when we reached government uh, and uh, during the highest point of pandemic, uh, uh, before I got in charge, uh, I was told by the president, uh, by the minister of health, that the uh, health system was collapsed and we were able to double the number of um, emergency room beds, thanks to organizing uh, logistics and also together with the private sector because we couldn't buy directly bec uh, uh, vaccines because they were being researched. So the private sector uh, made the first investment so that we could buy vaccines and so that we could uh, uh, register in the end list. Uh, but you know, of, as you know, as in any other country, there were a few problems around this. But first, uh, and also we started uh, opening uh, tourism and hotels that were closed by 90 percent and uh I'll tell you what it means for employment. People told us that it was crazy to uh, incentivize tourism. But uh, in 2020, between 2020 and 2021, um, 20, 20 percent of the hotels were able to open. So there was 50 percent more employments. And uh, we obviously found out that we, if we did not recover tourism, we could not recover the Dominican rep uh, economy. And, uh, uh, in, and to recover tourism, we had to recover health. And we succeeded to get uh, vaccines and I remember that we got the first the same day the vaccine in Colombia in the Republican Dominican and we started vaccinating intensely uh, throughout the country we vaccinated the uh, hotel workers uh, as well and uh, we reached the main point which was to open the economy and keep the health at the same time. And today, we are lethal level is the least of the world, 0.7. In the CDC, by the CDC, we're in risk one, just like the US. And we were able to open completely the economy. And that's why we were the country that better recovered worldwide with regards to tourism, uh, as the OIT uh, let us know. And um, it is true that today we have eliminated, I mean, we only have 10% of uh, COVID infrastructure. Uh, we have recovered at uh, best level in the Latin American economy. We were the ones that grew most in Latin America. We grew 12.3%. And, you know, just wait for me, you know, you, I know, but don't sing victory yet. Uh, you'll see. In the first uh, uh, quarter, we grew 6. Uh, one percent, and uh, we will continue with the same level in the following uh, quarters. So the uh, the, the near shoring, the French shoring, uh, we grew over thirty four percent, and in as far as exports, the traditional exports uh, have also increased from our side. So. Of course, you see that tourism has recovered, but in any economic area, we have recovered and even better. And even in agriculture, even though we're an island, our agricultural sector is quite powerful, but it was well affected because unlike other Latin American countries, we don't have oil. They, we import any raw materials, uh, uh, soy, uh, maize, uh, uh, for instance, uh, poultry production, poultry produ producers uh, say, we don't produce poultry, we ensemble poultry. And yes, it's true, it's because of the reality we, we have in our, in our island. But we have identified priorities, and this has helped us a lot. And with regards to inflation, and I will conclude by that, Marisol, we've had to com combine 
find a special funding. We doubled the uh, capacity for funding in the agricultural sector. That's why for the first time in 20 years, we haven't had to import rice. It was the first time that we overproduced bananas. I mean, we're talking about the, produ the produces most uh, consumed by Latin America, by, in, by Dominicans, uh, and also poultry, and we increased the funding on, of production. And also, uh, be, uh, after war, uh, raw materials have increased, and we've had to do subsidies. Uh, the price of the oil stayed at 85, and from now on, uh, I told the country that from 85 to 115, based on our calculations, we could keep our subsidies now. You know that it's 110. It's a double that uh, where it was. But today, in two hours, the Ministry of uh, the Minister of Industry and Commerce uh, will announce the subsidy to May, so that the price uh, the, uh, of poultry doesn't rise. And also, we have announced that we will subsidize uh, wheat. And also last year, we sub started subsidizing fertilizers so, uh, 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 it, because the price has uh, increased so much that we had to create a line of subsidies. And we, our fiscal administration has been as efficient as possible. And uh, it's true that we feel very proud and we're doing it very transparently. We're constantly fighting uh, corruption so that such resources uh, are profitable. And uh, last year, the deficit was less. And this year, due to this situation, and we've al already announced it to multilateral uh, bodies, we will have to increase uh, uh, deficit uh, with regards to what was planned last year. What I can tell you, Marisol, is that this should be a day-to-day -day administration because we need to adapt to the change of prices and we can't foresee lo in long term. And long term, I'm talking three months. Uh, every week we meet with the econo economy committee, with the agricultural committee with a health committee so that we can determine the actions uh, required. Uh, congratulations, President. Uh, this is good. We, uh, yes, we are in a very fluid world with external factors that are quite complicated. And I would like to now ask uh, Vice President Boluarte. Peru was a country that had the highest uh, economic recovery figures in 2021. We're talking about 13.1 percent. But what is the vision and the strategy of your government to reinforce governability, conf co governance, conf con uh, confidence, trust, and to work with the private sector to promote more investment and therefore to develop employment? Thank you, Marisol. First of all, I would like to thank on behalf of Peru each of uh, the participants to this World Forum, the World Economic Forum, where countries will present what we, we live every day in our societies. In your question, Marisol, I would first like to open the market, not just to focus on Peru, but uh, to speak about Latin America. In Latin America, we need to think that the uh, human being is at the center of social development. And we have to have in mind several important factors. First of all, we need to place, as I say, the individual as the main center of the economic development. Secondly, the state needs to uh, set priorities, which are health, education, and safety and security. And thirdly, the private sector must have a relevant role where it may uh, develop a virtual cycle, circle where we can grow. And I'm talking about uh, businesses and so, uh, our communities, our societies. In Peru, in that sense, we consider that uh, informality, labor informality, has to change, and we need to formalize it. And how can we succeed? 
in that. Well, we need to simplify red tapes and it has to be in a short time so that we can eliminate bureaucratic uh, 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 requirements which damage uh, employment uh, growth. But all these processes need to be digitalized so we simplify administration so that we simplify red tape and any process and this will give us a most more efficient government and that will help us grow economically. But in Peru, in order to ensure the economy in 2021, we grew 13.5 percent and this economic growth was the greatest among the region. And our president from Colombia has said they've grown 13 percent. And uh, we have grown in sp uh, 3 percent. And in spite of the pandemic, in spite of the fact that last year we formed our government, we managed the economy of the country in a responsible way. And in 2021, we grew 13.5 points. And in this first quarter, unlike last year, we have already grown 3.8 percent with comparison to the first quarter of last year. Consequently, Peru is a country which is responsible of a stable economy management. And this enables businessmen to invest because we guarantee a responsible legal support. Therefore, investors may invest uh, in a safe way and also with clear rules where the businessmen and the investors will go together and taking care of our environment, uh, which is so damaged. We've been, all, all of us presidents have been uh, uh, sharing lunch, and we've all heard that if all leaders don't just, and not just the Latin American leaders, but the world leaders, if we don't do something to take care of uh, our planet, we will uh, put in risk not just food, which keeps us alive, but the survival of human being on the planet Earth. So we invite all of you investors to visit Peru to invest, because you may be sure that we will uh, welcome you with a stable economy, with a legal guarantee so that you and we as a Peruvian society may develop jointly. Thank you, Marisol. Thank you, Vice President. Thank you very much. President Chavez, this is the first international trip that you take as the uh, president of Costa Rica. We value your present very, presence very much. Costa Rica is known for being a stable, safe, secure country with a lot of social equality. And uh, you avoided this uh, great uh, uh, wave that, uh, the, uh, of the pandemics, but you're still facing some emerging challenges. And uh, you will have to go through a complex period in your presidency. We've heard that your corruption is at the center of your concerns in your uh, mandate. So could you tell us a bit more about your ma mandate in Costa Rica? Thank you very much, Marisol. Thank you for the president of Colombia, of uh, Republican, uh, Dom Dom Dominican Republic, and uh, the vice president of Peru. I know I didn't avoid anything on the contrary. I, uh, in, I, I'm the heir of what needs to be corrected, because unlike the experiences uh, uh, of my colleagues, Costa Rica didn't do it really well, and on, the, on to the contrary, we have deteriorated quite uh, a lot. In spite of the fact that Costa Rica is still a democracy, Costa Rica is a country that will maintain its democratic values of respect for human rights, uh, women empowerment, uh, respect for minorities, and an absolute commitment 
unbreakable commitment, I should say, with the environment and with private property. Therefore, I cannot report uh, the successes of my two weeks uh, 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 as the president of Costa Rica, but I, I am able to tell you about the challenges we are going to face. First of all, to keep this social cohesion, this peace that we've enjoyed, not just uh, in Costa Rica, but we are a magnet for people from other countries that look for a better life in Costa Rica. And this is not cheap. This is more pressure on us. And we do it with our open art, heart. But this is a pressure. Uh, this means that it's a pressure for uh, social services and our fiscal department. So we need to, first of all, develop more and better employment. And this goes through uh, giving more trust to the private sector. In Costa Rica, the dichotomy we have, the, the fake the fake dichotomy we have uh, been living for years, uh, private sector or pr public sector, uh, is, shouldn't be. There was no country worldwide that uh, succeeded prosperity uh, only with the private sector or only with the public sector. These are two uh, fingers of the same hand. So we need to have a, a vibrant uh, private private sector that doesn't corrupt and a public sector that is not corrupted. And this is what we want to, to do. And we've already presented uh, laws like, uh, and we've uh, incentivized people who denounce corruptions, etc. So we need to improve our fiscal situation. We cannot build, and as President Duque mentioned, uh, housing with uh, interest rates of 12% in dollars. This is too expensive and very dangerous for the, uh, the one who will pay the mortgage and for the financiers. So we have spoken with many investors today, and we've told them not red tape, red carpet. <laughs> Costa Rica is open for business. And I will uh, break all bottlenecks. I will break all chains, and we will open our doors. Come and invest in Costa Rica. You will find a renewed, renewed uh, ambience, uh, always with social responsibility, definitely. We've lost also. Uh, the distribution of income, because Costa Rica was the country that was the most equalitarian concerning income distribution together with Uruguay, but it hasn't worked, and it's deteriorated. Why? Because our uh, fiscal system, instead of improving uh, the distribution of income, has worsened it. The quality of public services, and this is a commitment that we have in Costa Rica, why we can discuss whether it's the distribution of income is good or bad, if uh, it goes against incentives, etc. But what we uh, agree on 100% throughout Costa Rica is that the equality, equal opportunities is not to be discussed, and the state should give good opportunities to, through human capital, by education, uh, through education, health, and uh, public uh, security. And then there's the quality of public services. Each time uh, we g do a PISA test, and this is, uh, we've been a year uh, in the OCDE, uh, and we celebrate it tomorrow, actually. So we're already an OCDE country, but each time we take a PISA test, our ranking goes down. And when we uh, spend almost 8% of the GDP in education, and Vietnam is number seven in the world in mathematics, and they only spend 4% of the uh, GDP in education, and we're 54 or something, and we spend double. And we're not, we don't even compare with Finland. We don't compare with Korea. We compare ourselves with Korea or Vietnam. So the agenda is quite challenging. Uh, and we've uh, uh, had uh, a lot of fiscal disorder. Uh, and uh, the exchange rates 
and, 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 and therefore, the, the Costa Rica are net importers of energy, so we suffer from the invasion of uh, Russia by, uh, in Ukraine, of in Ukraine by Russia, and we import uh, wheat. And as the President Abinader said, uh, we, this is what we maize or so we use for protein, proteins. So we will have to adapt our economy to the international, uh, the, the change in international trade. And I am extending myself, but I will end here. The reality of things is as follows. All changes in public policies and all structural changes generate winners and losers. The challenge of our government is to make sure that winners are the majority of Costa Rica people. And who will be the losers, the ones who benefited from public policies for years uh, due to private mon monopolies. In Costa Rica, there are private monopolies. Costa the state has given businessmen a monopoly, uh, saying you can only in import uh, some medicines, etc. This is ending. And we're working very hard on this. Uh, so we want to generate changes that will make a lot of winners. And where losers will have to acknowledge the fact that they uh, benefited illegitimately from uh, the state. So this is our challenges uh, from uh, the uh, state of uh, things that we got until a five years' time when we want to hand the country and we hope. Uh, much better organized. So, well, thank you very much, dear President Chavez, and I already invite you uh, to the economic World Economic Forum to come next year, and you will be able to then tell us the result of the agenda that you have implemented, that will have been implementing by then. Now, um, President Abinader, in our region, there's a lot of development uh, uh, aspects or, or uh, possibilities. One of them is tourism. We've also heard uh, the concerns uh, about uh, the deterioration of our environment. With this executive innovative capacity, what do you propose for the Latin American region? As And I'm talking about some specific measures to develop ecotourism. It's an area where Costa Rica was very relevant. Uh, yes, Marisol. I would like to get back to the previous point you mentioned, our preparation. We prepared uh, with subsidies. Uh, but uh, when we, uh, after a month, we got to the government, we started giving a general uh, medical insurance of, through the uh, public uh, health system to 2.4 million Dominicans that still didn't have it. So now 98% of the Dominicans have a basic uh, uh, medical insurance. And this uh, helped a lot with the health recovery. And we doubled the amount of directly uh, uh, economic, we uh, um, we raised the subsidies we give to mothers and fathers who are in uh, vulnerable situations. Uh, uh, we gave 800 uh, subsidies to 800,000 uh, uh, individuals, and now we're giving to a million point six uh, individuals, and we've doubled the the subsidy given to these individuals. And distribution and social justice are what should be the objective of any economic po uh, policy, which is to reduce the levels of poverty. The Republican, uh, the Dominican Republic has a different uh, matrix of uh, currency distribution, and it's very important for us. Concerning the generation of currencies, there's tourism, the Frank, French areas, and uh, the also the money sent by immigrants, and all Latin American countries uh, get that, but we also know here that we all know here that uh, currencies are very good to impulse construction and building, much more than one may think. Uh, so 
the French area, uh, what the, the French shoring, the uh, tax-free area, tax-free zone, uh, enabled uh, uh, companies to open themselves. Uh, for instance, in our tax-free uh, zones, we have uh, $1 billion of uh, technical devices uh, apart from the tax-free zones uh, that uh, make uh, textile and clothes, etc. And there's, they also develop technologies there. Now, getting back to tourism, I think that Latin America is very diverse, and therefore its tourism should be diverse as well. We have tourism of sun and beach. It, it's a massive. It's the most important. But uh, we also combine it with uh, ecological tourism, green tourism, in uh, relevant areas that we have. Uh, we have natural uh, reserves and, and, and reservations, and we also uh, enable special visits. And there's also historical visits, because you might rem remember that Santo Domingo was the first city built in Latin in, in America. So uh, we have the uh, he, there the, the, the buildings of the um, uh, Spanish uh, town then and we want we are reconstructing and 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 uh, refurbishing all our historical monuments um, yesterday in one panel on tourism the minister of tourism of arabia saudi uh, said that uh, they are creating new uh, touristic uh, destinations throughout the pandemics and we did the same we uh, created 11 uh, a, a top a type of tourism which is uh, uh, you know another uh, type of tourism which is more uh, greener and it's uh, it will be oriented towards uh, ecotourism we have a province where 78% of the territory is a national park, and this is going to be located in one part of the province to be able to access all this protected area with a less uh, dense tourism. It will not be mass tourism like it is in Punta Cana. So each country, for instance, the case of Costa Rica, it has developed uh, its ecotourism, okay? But Colombia has all the possibilities. Uh, it has Cartagena, which is a very beautiful colonial city. It can also have ecotourism or beach tourism. Brazil is a whole continent, so it has everything. And I think that each country, uh, being Latin America as diverse as it is, each country needs to identify its tourism. There is a need of tourism. Uh, there are lots of possibilities. Of course, sun and beach tourism is massive, but there are also, for instance, uh, ecotourism, cultural tourism, historic uh, or historical tourism. And we need to know, Marisol, that the new generations are perfectly aware uh, of tourism as being uh, as having a very uh, important uh, uh, ecological impact. For instance, my, my daughters don't go to a restaurant where there is plastic, and they're young people, of course. So they're, they have a, a high uh, uh, awareness of the importance of um, ecological matters, and everybody needs uh, to have so. I would like to say something uh, about that. Our countries, and especially in the Caribbean region, we have we're those which have less uh, polluted the world for centuries because we haven't had a, a very important industrial development. But we belong to those, well, to, to the to the ten percent of countries which are more vulnerable to climate change. We have the enormous problem of sargasso in all Latin America, and when we see the increase of the uh, level of the sea, of the sea level, we're really vulnerable to global warming. And we need to be aware of that. And uh, the more developed countries need to be aware of that. Ivan and I have been discussing in Costa Rica when 
President Chavez uh, got to office, uh, we discussed about creating a whole park between Colombia and the uh, Dominican Republic to try and preserve our waters, our seas, against any kind of exploitation that can have a negative impact on us. And we're doing all this jointly. And between the ADD, the Alliance for the Development of Democracy, uh, between Costa Rica and Panama, we're also discussing about the different possibilities and different actions that we can um, implement together to protect environment, the environment, and to protect our natural resources. Thank you very much, President. And, and just a <laughs> last thing, there is a very important act which is now in Congress and which is a priority uh, for me. I have established as a priority that has to do with the use of soils. And we need to know what each area is used for. Um, this one is for mining, this one is for tourism, this one is for agriculture, uh, to uh, prevent uh, uh, non-organized development. And this is of the utmost importance in all of our countries. So you have many things to feel proud about and very optimistic, by the way. Uh, you talked about the environment. Costa Rica has developed its um, environmental awareness um, uh, long before the rest of Latin America. Which is your uh, view about the environmental agenda and uh, climate uh, change agenda? Well, Costa Rica is a country that will never go back in its commitments and in its will to achieve carbon neutrality and to contribute and to be a good citizen in the um, among all the nations. Costa Rica is still committed. We need to do several things, though, a bit differently. We have managed to reverse deforestation. I think we are the only tropical country that have managed to do so. We doubled <clears throat> the um, um, jungle uh, area in our countries. But what do we, do, what do we still uh, need to do? Well, we need to adapt ourselves to climate change because climate change has an enormous impact on us all. And we are not investing enough in uh, adaptation uh, measures and uh, to rebuild. Secondly, we have historic challenges in the management of our rivers. We, unluckily, we have invested very little in, in sewage system, and we have a lot of pollution in our rivers, so we're going to work on that. And the uh, management of solids, we're not recycling solid waste, we're not doing um, circular economy, we're not doing any waste to energy, etc. We're still improving our uh, electricity grid uh, towards more renewable energies, even though we have overinvested in the uh, um, power uh, generation with um, fossil fuels. We're going to keep going forward. Times are difficult, so we'll do it as we can, uh, relentlessly, uh, at the rhythm of uh, uh, global uh, conditions without sacrificing uh, our present well-being in exchange of a better future, but without sacrificing the future uh, for an immediate gain. No. There is an economic um, rational and a social uh, well, uh, well-being that Costa Rica needs to manage correctly, and we're going to do that. Yes, thank you. President, you mentioned uh, net zero carbon neutrality, and President Duque has positioned in Colombia's agenda, many uh, um, engine, uh, many development engines. You have developed a um, roadmap for uh, net zero, and you have promoted a strategy 
of a digital transformation, which is absolutely relevant, and more so in pandemic uh, times where we have seen an acceleration of these capacities and these needs that have um, appeared during the pandemic. So, President, can you please tell us how you see these two uh, topics and which would be your recommendations for the rest of Latin America? Well, first of all, we have had here very clear interventions uh, on my three colleagues here. And I would like to say that one of the factors that unites uh, Latin America with the rest of the world has to do with the environmental agenda. In the specific case here of Colombia, we're talking about a country that has 50 percent of its territory in the um, rainforest. Uh, 35 percent is in the Amazon uh, region, 52 percent of the uh, deserts of the planet, uh, 900,000 kilometers of territorial waters, and we only emit 0.6 percent of the uh, global um, greenhouse emissions. But we are one of the most um, threatened countries by climate change. So our attitude was we are uh, going to act and we are going to show an agenda where we commit ourselves to be uh, to, to get to net zero in 2050, to reduce 51 percent of our emissions in 2030, but to implement other actions which have an immediate effect, like the like thir declaring 30 percent of the territory as a protected area and um, build an agenda on uh, uh, energy transition, circular economy, clean mobility, uh, etc. So what can we show today <clears throat> after four years of this uh, policies? We had only 28 m megawatts uh, of uh, renewable energies. We had, uh, of course, uh, hydric um, generation, but hydraulic generation. But we uh, multiplied by 100 these energies, and they will be installed this year. So our grid, more than 90 percent, will come from renewable energies, conventional and, and conventional and non-conventional. We said it. We did it. Secondly, we launched an act on uh, clean mobility in Colombia. It's a, an, an area where there are lots of emissions, and now our uh, um, urban uh, transportation fleet is the uh, greenest one, and it's the largest one in the region. The, uh, it, it's uh, uh, electrically uh, powered. So we um, put the uh, public sector uh, in the um, circular economy, and we now have hundreds of companies working there. And this has been an element uh, that has linked companies uh, uh, with consumers, because consumers want companies to be more responsible. And we made our decisions uh, to accompany this movement, and we sent a clear message to the world. We're not going to wait 2030 to declare 30 percent of the territory as a protected area. We're going to do it in 2022. And this is placing ourselves in front and face in the face of another challenge. If we declare a protected area, we really need to guarantee this protection uh, with the communities. And there have already been uh, 10,000 families that we have that have we pay for it for um, working in that area. And we also promote a, a low carbon um, breeding <clears throat> and in areas where um, that have been affected by deforestation, we are reducing this deforestation thanks uh, multi to multiple campaigns. And uh, we launched a strategy called Biodiverse Cities. And this is the way to zero uh, net. And I think that this logic, this uh, rational, shows us that there is an environmental competitiveness. And this is something that we have uh, talked about, uh, my, my three colleagues, even with Dean and President um, Chavez Roles and President Castillo at the time. And um, we need to produce better and with a less environmental uh, uh, impact. And Colombia is one of the countries today, one of the countries in the world that has a um, less uh, carbon uh, footprint um, 
compared to its uh, GDP. And this is something which unites all of us in Latin America, all the presidents in Latin America, uh, in Latin America uh, for French-shoring and near-shoring. But our carbon footprint is much less than other countries. And I finished saying that at the end of the day uh, in Glasgow last year, I was asked, why do we have these uh, s such ambitious goals in Colombia? Well, why not? We, because, of course, we only represent 0.6% uh, of global emissions. But if we, the countries that are really victims of the uh, climate change, do not have uh, high ambitions, well, the wealthiest countries, those who have most contributed to, uh, contributed to this uh, crisis, uh, will not have an example to follow and enough pressure. So I think that this road to uh, net zero needs to be harmonized with uh, uh, growth and with equity. And another two uh, um, topics, this needs to bring benefits. Um, access to uh, uh, drinking water uh, has been granted to many families, many more families, and we are uh, reducing 50 percent of the gap of electrification. We are giving um, solutions with um, like solar panels, like what we did 10, uh, 10 or 15 uh, days ago uh, to uh, Indian communities, indigenous communities in Crucito, in Guantaraigua, in Baupes. And these are very, very strong messages. And I would like to conclude, Marisol, by saying that we as a country have also to be aware that social transformation requires to um, give a largest uh, uh, coverage to the whole country, social coverage. And we are getting to the most vulnerable population, showing them that we can all contribute to reduce our individual carbon uh, footprint. So this gives a consistency, a general consistency towards in a row towards net zero. Well, we don't have a lot of time, but we uh, inaugurated with you in Medellin a, a center for the fourth uh, um, industrial revolution three years ago. And technological transformation, digital transformation was very present in your agenda. Yes, in 30 seconds. We propose to reach 70% of coverage in August with a high speed train with uh, mobile coverage and we've already reached that figure in cities and we already already reached 60 percent in rural areas then uh, technological uh, businesses with uh, uh, added value of uh, green uh, of green activities we've incentivized these uh, companies and we already have uh, two startups and a third one with plug-in in the following months. And uh, you know, David Belles is Colombian, but we talk a lot about Brazil, but uh, he's a great uh, regional promoter. And my last message is the double uh, grad grades in talents. We will have trained 100,000 programmers, and this is the uh, most important talents we are developing. And yes, you have a, a Peruvian wife, of course, but uh, Vice President, I would like to get back to you on uh, social inclusion. We are going through uh, such great challenges that most vulnerable communities are the ones that end up being most affected. And your, uh, in, in your ministry, you have uh, social development uh, and social inclusion. What are the main strategies of the Peruvian government to go forward? Uh, with regards to social inclusion and to beat poverty. Thank you, Marisol. Before answering your question, I would like to reiterate to the business uh, com community that Peru uh, is trustable with regards to investment, especially with regards to natural gas in our region. And in the Cuna region, uh, frontier with Bol Bolivia, we have lithium. And uh, we can generate an industry that doesn't damage the environment. And we can impulse uh, uh, making cars with lithium and also with oil.
and we won't have to use oil that contaminates so much our environment. So please come to Peru and because we have ecological uh, rules and uh, you, uh, you may invest in agriculture and we can feed the world thanks to that. Now, Marisol, getting back to your question, Pan Peru was not the worst affected by the pandemic. I think the whole world, Latin America and the whole world were affected. And we've started uh, in gov governing uh, nine months ago, so we are still uh, uh, taking f uh, small steps as babies. But the right wing in the country does not want to acknowledge the legitimate uh, triumph of President Pedro Castillo in our elections of uh, June 30th uh, last year. And since uh, the President and I swore to serve the Peruvian people, we have not been able to govern in peace. But even though through such a challenging situation, uh, we were firm, and as a friend Duque says, we are resilient, and we face such daily attacks, uh, and we go forward. And in that sense, President Pedro Castillo has set policies towards the most vulnerable uh, population in our country, because the uh, pandemic has taken us 10 points uh, lower with regards to development and quality of life uh, and standard of living. And this has affected 30 percent of the population in Peru. And I'm talking about po poors and extreme poors. So from the Ministry of Development and Social Inclusion that I lead, since we got into a position, we created the Yanapa Peru uh, initiative. It's an ambitious support that's covered almost 50% of the Peruvian population. 13 million point five uh, individuals in Peru have uh, received their Yanapa Peru. And also the Aliguarna program. Aliguarna means strong man. We attend over four million students between uh, of, of primary and secondary school. Uh, secondary, right for now, in the uh, in the forest area. Uh, but we are going forward so that uh, at the end of this half year, we can reach the whole secondary education by supporting uh, food for students uh, in the country. And uh, since we saw that uh, this is efficient, we have been also asked to bring uh, meet to vulnerable populations. Uh, consequently, uh, Marisol, uh, yes, we don't have much time left. Right? Well, in uh, Ollas Comunes, we attended over 243,000 individuals in a vulnerable situation. But Marisol, I would like to focus on this beautiful program among the seven programs administered by the Ministry of Development and Social Inclusion. It's, it's a program called PAIS, country, and its action is PIAS. What are the PIAS? Well, the Peruvian forest is quite dense, and through these PIAS that are boats, we transport the services of the state throughout all the native communities. And I'm talking about the Amazon River area. We bring uh, vaccines, health, and the program against the on against violence against women. We also bring them the bank so that they can uh, get their subsidies uh, paid. And we also support the uh, sisters of native communities. So we have these pias, these boats that uh, can uh, sail throughout the rivers, uh, even in the most dense, fo dense forest. And uh, where pias can't reach, then we bring uh, planes. 
And these, I'm talking about the regions that were most excluded from the state support. So we have these boats and uh, small uh, planes, but we also have 470, 457 tambos, uh, and they do the same service as these boats on the Amazon River or the uh, planes. They also bring uh, uh, services of the state to give uh, quality of life to our brothers and sisters. And this is what our President Pedro Castilla has put, has uh, set up to, to service uh, the Peruvian uh, population. Uh, thank you, Marisol. Thank you, Vice President. There's one topic that hasn't been mentioned and which is quite important, migration flu fluxes. Uh, the President uh, uh, has um, uh, mentioned the flows that are so important for all Latin America. And it is important to attend the causes, to 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 analyze the causes of uh, migration. And a global shaper uh, talked to me yesterday, and he asked me to give him one minute, Alejandro, just one minute, so he could make a comment. Please identify yourself, uh, and please give us your testimony. Hello. Good afternoon. I'm Alejandro Dali. I'm a displaced migrant in Colombia since nine years and a global shaper of Go Bogota. President, who've implemented excellent measures to welcome Venezuelan migrants, not just in Colombia, but it was an example for the region and for the world. What would you recommend other countries in the region to keep on implementing a migration agenda for Venezuelan migrants throughout the world? Well, first of all, thank you for your question and for your comment and for telling us about your experience, which actually touches me to the heart. I would like to start by saying the following. The world needs to forget about the two awful ways of facing migration. The first awful way is xenophobia. In many parts of the world, the migrant is received with uh, stigma, stigma and uh, uh, aggressiveness. And then the second uh, that negative uh, element is uh, indifference. The migrant arrives and is left alone without any support. I, from the first day of my government, and I said it my campaign, I wanted to uh, stop both things, and I wanted to set up a status of temporary uh, reception in Colombia. And I was told that it was not popular, when, but I thought that when uh, we're talking about people who are fighting for their lives, popularity doesn't matter anymore. What matters is human considerations. And with this status, uh, my head of uh, department is here, and he, she's been with me every day with Francisco Espinosa and the uh, Colombian government. We're going to give one million cards of uh, uh, temporary status uh, for migrants, and this is historic, and, it's, uh, we'll, and we will give them in, the, in a month. And there's the biometrics and registry. Well, uh, you know, thanks to registries and biometrics, we will be able to give another 800,000 cards. And uh, we always heard that it would uh, uh, take employment from Colombians. But even with the status, we have reduced unemployment, and especially we have reduced uh, uh, informal employments, and uh, we have increased the access to housing and. And it goes and, and it's been a, and it has eradicated this indifference. But also governors and uh, mayors, the whole society of Colombia has shown a great solidarity. And I will keep my uh, commitment firmly. But I would also like to take this opportunity to say here that we cannot be indifferent in front of this humanitarian tragedy, which is the dictatorship of Nicolás Maduro. We need to keep on fighting this until Venezuela gets back to democracy. We need to be solidar with migrants, and we need to defend democracy. Thank you very much.
Thank you very much. Dear Presidents, dear Mrs. Vice President, we have uh, gotten a few minutes uh, beyond time, but it was a very rich uh, conversation, and I hope that all leaders from Latin America, from all sectors, can uh, agree with each other in spite of local divergences and uh, in spite of the differences between our countries. I hope that we can reach a long-term agenda that will lead us to sustainable and inclusive development in Latin America. Thank you very much. Thank you, Marisol.